have the perfect guest for this conversation. House Majority Whip Steve Scalise, Republican from Louisiana. Uh, it's great to have you. We're going to be talking about the GOP health care bill and what the whip uh, thinks about the vote count right now. But I do want to get your take on this breaking news uh, on what the Secretary of State just said out of North Korea. Did you know that this uh, policy would be apparently changed in terms of the rhetoric coming out of the United States representative on this issue? Well, obviously, it's all developing very quickly, but I'm encouraged uh, that you see Secretary of State Tillerson uh, going over there and, frankly, confronting uh, somebody who's been saber-rattling and confronting not only our enemies, uh, but provoking the United States as well uh, with their nuclear tests and uh, their stated, whether or not their intentions or not, but their, uh, their move towards having the ability to send an intercontinental ballistic missile into the United States. It ought to concern us all. I'm glad they're focusing on it. Quick follow, if they came to you and you said, do you think we can get the votes to take military action against North Korea, how fact sensitive do you think that would be? What kind of appetite do you think there'd even be for something like that? Well, I think the fact that they're not taking any options off the table is important. And I think if there's a case to make, you're going to see support in Congress for the commander in chief to be able to carry out his mission. Because mm. remember, declarations of war like that, that's your guy's duty first uh, before it gets to the president, certainly. All right, so that's that issue. Let's talk health care. You know what the CNN uh, count was as of about 11 o'clock last night. CNN believes that it's about 21 of your party membership may go against this bill. That number is very relevant because it means it wouldn't pass. Do you buy that whip count? And if not, why not? Well, like with any whip count on any high-profile bill, uh, my job is to work with our members on a regular basis. I'm talking to members today that are undecided, that are no and lean no, and frankly, there's a path for most of them to get to yes. And we're working very closely with the White House on very specific changes uh, that get some of those members that are no to a yes vote on the bill. So, you, so the, the premise is... We've got to change this in order to get it passed. Now, obviously, the White House was resistant to that, seems to be changing. Paul Ryan seemed to be changing his tune on that as well. What are the biggest things that people want to change as far as your experience hearing it? Well, actually, the president's been very open. If you look over the last week, two weeks, really, the president's been talking about an ongoing negotiation. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's been the case. A lot of our members have brought additional ideas. Uh, I think it's a very good bill already. And there's some changes that have been brought forward by members from every faction in our conference that I think make it an even better bill. Uh, but the bottom line on this bill is it actually does lower costs in health care premiums for families, so it saves families money. It cuts taxes by over $800 billion, which puts real money in the pockets of working families. Uh, it reduces the deficit. The most important thing, though, is it gets the federal government out of your health care decisions, so families actually get to decide, to decide what's best for them. That's all in the bill. Uh, and that's not going to change. It's only going to get better. Uh, and, and I'm looking forward to working with the president to continue getting more members to yes and then passing a repeal and replace bill out of the House. What are you dealing with more? People who are saying, hey, this doesn't go far enough. I want more of these mandates taken out. I want more of the tax structure taken out. Or people saying, I can't go for a bill that's going to work against my own constituents and leave people without insurance coverage in the name of access. I can't sell access. I need to have actual coverage. What are you dealing with more? Well, the bill actually does increase access, but it gives people actual freedom in health care. They right. get to make but their access own isn't covered. But that's, I'm what dealing... I'm, that's what I'm dealing with. Like in your state, well, right you, have you have a huge coverage, population. But no access. Well, right. I, I get I get what the, the rhetoric is back and forth, but I'm saying the reality is in states like yours, you have a huge Medicaid accessible population that's only growing. And for those people, it doesn't matter how much money you put in an account for them. They're not going to have the money on top of it to get the coverage that they need, especially if you remove mandates of what has to be provided by insurance companies. How concerned are you when you go back home that people who are working hard for their money are going to say, you didn't make this better for me? My biggest concern, and believe me, I've gotten direct testimonies from hundreds of constituents in my district who have told me their health care costs are going up by double digits. I've got constituent after constituent in southeast Louisiana who tells me about their deductibles being over $10,000, which means they can't even use their health care. So they're paying a premium. It's a very high premium. It's going up. Uh, they have a card for health insurance, but they're not able to use it because the deductible is too high. That's what we're focusing on addressing is lowering costs and allowing people to actually go buy plans that are better for their family than some unelected bureaucrat in Washington saying this is the only thing you can buy. That's what's not working. We change that. And look, we're working with members from every faction within our conference who have good ideas to make this even better. And the focus is 
how can this actually put more power in the hands of families so they can make their health care decisions at affordable cost to buy the plan they want? How do you make it cheaper for people if you take the healthy people out of the pool? Right, because that's what the mandate was. They didn't throw it in there because they just like to force people to buy things that they don't want. I mean, I know that that's working politically, but you force the young people in because that's what makes a company reduce its cost, reduce what it's going to charge you, is because what its risk pool is. What is the chance that it will have to pay out money? Right, insurance companies are in the business of not paying, not paying. So how do you replace that incentive to reduce costs with your plan? Well, under Obamacare, first of all, what you're seeing is healthy people getting out. They're paying the penalty and not being in Obamacare. That's one of the reasons the costs are going up, because you only have less healthy people in the plan So isn't right the now, fix to make the penalty higher so they have to be in? What we're focused I mean, that's what the Democrats is, are arguing. What we're focused on is plans that have a lower cost. Even the CBO score says our plan will lower premium costs by double digits, which means people, more people can actually get in and buy plans that work for their family. That's what lowers overall costs. Plus, right. we establish But are you making them pools. make a bet on their own health? I get this scenario where you're asking somebody who's 60 years old to buy a plan that has prenatal care. I get, I get why, as right. an example, that's not what you want to do, but it's also not a general situation. Um, you, the upside is if I buy a plan that's right for me, thank God, right now, my kids and I, we're healthy. Um, but then I'm making a bet, right? I'm making a bet that nothing bad is going to happen that's not covered by my plan. That was part of it. Make the companies give you all the care you could need. That's what insurance is about, insuring yourself against the inevitable. Right. And, and look, we, we still protect people with pre-existing conditions from being discriminated against. Uh, so that's protected in our bill. But we also set up high-risk pools to give states additional money uh, to help people with pre-existing conditions so that you can lower costs. We put real money in place to do that uh, with the savings that we get by reforming programs like Medicaid, where we actually give governors the flexibility. And by the way, most governors in, this, in the country have said, give us more flexibility on Medicaid. We can actually help more people with less money. We can But they haven't asked for less money. They said Medicaid. give us more. Everybody wants everything, and, right? And but in our bill, governors are saying money. give us more we control, give but they want more money. money. But we give, right. In this case, we don't give them less money, but we actually give them real flexibility and control to design their program as best as it works for their state, because every state's got different populations. Louisiana's Medicaid population is a whole lot different than the state of New York's. True. Uh, yet, if you want to make a change, you've got to go to Washington to get a waiver, and usually they tell you no. But the numbers do go that. down in Medicaid in terms of what you're going to give the states. You just phase it in over a number of years, but it's not going up. It's going down. No, it's, it's a slower increase. Only in Washington where if you get more money next year, but it's not as much as you wanted to get, do they call that a cut. States will actually be getting an increase uh, next year over current year, but it's a slower growth rate because you're giving them real flexibility so they can run the program. But the rate of it is going to be down from where they are right now. Four years from now, that was a big factor for the CBO in showing how many would wind up not having coverage because we all know whether it's you who takes them off the rolls or the states who take people off the rolls, they're going to wind, out with, uh, wind up without coverage. Well, some of, that, some of that reduction comes from a work requirement we actually put in. There's a verification process in our bill where every six months you have to go get re-verified, and if you're not eligible for Medicaid, which, by the way, you shouldn't be in Medicaid if you're not eligible, mm -hmm. yet they never verify it. So somebody that's not qualified for Medicaid maybe six months from now, they're still getting the service, even though they right. shouldn't be getting that taxpayer funding. They actually will be, if they've got a job, if they're making more money, uh, that they're not eligible for Medicaid, under our bill, we actually verify that and say, look, you've got a job. This program's for low-income people, poor people, people that are down on their luck. Uh, if you got back on your feet, uh, you're not eligible for the program. The federal government used to just look the other way and spend billions of dollars on a lot of that waste. Uh, it's time to say, look, if you're, if you're eligible for the program and you need this right. help, we want it. But if you're not eligible, uh, why should the program still be carried? Right. And the push-up back is that's real, but it's an exception, not the rule. But I've got to tell you, uh, Congressman Solis, this was very helpful to the audience. Appreciate you Thanks. being here. They're hearing you say you can get the votes. Let's see what happens next. You're always welcome on the show. Appreciate it. All right.